You're listening to the Generation to Generation podcast, episode 12. We live in a fast-paced world. The average American checks their phone 80 times a day. 70% keep it within reach while they sleep. In a culture constantly barraged by information at a frantic pace, it's no wonder people feel numb and burnt out. Joining me on the podcast today is John Eldridge, and we talk about his upcoming book, Get Your Life Back, Everyday Practices for a World Gone Mad. John provides practices for people to regain control of their lives and heal their souls. I believe this interview will be a source of encouragement in whatever season of ministry or life you find yourself. As always, thanks for listening. Well, I'm glad you're joining us today. My name is Michael Coggin, and on today's episode, we have John Eldridge. John is a best-selling author, a counselor, and a teacher. He's also president of Ransom Heart, a ministry devoted to helping people discover the heart of God, recover their own hearts and God's love, and learn to live in God's kingdom. John and his wife, Stacy live near Colorado Springs, Colorado. John, it's really good to have you on the show today. Yeah, thank you, Michael. It's a joy to chat with you, and I'm really grateful to be on. Thanks. Well, I've really been looking forward to our conversation today, and maybe I think a good place for us to start before you know we start talking about your book was wondering if you could share a little bit with our listeners about your first memory of hearing the gospel preached. You know what? I had a pretty radical encounter with the gospel. I um, was raised in what I would call a pretty typical agnostic American home. Uh, parents had uh, no faith, um, kind of more humanists, and Southern California in the 60s, and, and uh, just had, I had literally no background in Jesus, in gospel, not even in church. I think I had been in church once in my life for a funeral, uh, and I was desperately hungry in my high school years. I I, I was looking for meaning. I was I was looking for God, and I tried. I tried everything. Um, it was a little bit like C.S. Lewis's story, where I just I pushed down every door. Um, Eastern mysticism and Lao Tzu and Native American spirituality and the New Age movement was really big in in L.A. in the '60s, and so I read stuff like that, and none of it worked. It was I, by the grace of God, He was pursuing me in my hunger before I knew it. And I would read this stuff, and I would just go, no, nope, that's not it. Mm-hmm. And, and how I knew that, I don't know. But then um, I was part of the drug culture in the, in the 60s and 70s, and you know, people were dropping acid to try and have these, what Francis Schaeffer called, upper story experiences. We, we really were seeking truth. We were seeking God. And uh, I knew I was looking, I was very deliberately looking for God. And and, um, one night, Jesus showed up in my bedroom. Mm. And I I honestly hadn't had anyone share the gospel with me. Um, But I was very aware that my humanity was being more and more dark. Uh, You know, the New Age thing is very bizarre and, and... narcissistic and the drug culture is also very narcissistic and dark. And, and I, what I was aware of, I just, this was my conviction experience was I am not a good person. I am not a, I'm not a good human being and there's darkness and I'm ashamed of it and I hate it. And I don't like what I'm becoming. And my prayer was literally, I could feel the presence of Jesus in my bedroom. I think I was 17 years old and, and I said, Jesus, I don't, I'm not a loving person, and I don't like what I am. I don't know what to do, but I have a feeling that you do. And so if you would come, please come. Mm-hmm. That, that was my salvation prayer, as best I understood it. And man, he came. I mean, I opened the door and boom, um, you know, I was very quickly off drugs and and out of all of that bizarre stuff and our across the street neighbors invited me to go to church with them. And you know, I came to church, met a great group of people and just boom, like that. I was in, I was thoroughly in. Yeah. Just as you share that, John, I'm just so thankful for God's faithfulness to you and your story, you know, and just even kind of you mentioning, um, 
just kind of beauty and darkness, but even just the darkness in this world, just that kind of leads, you know, to a lessening of humanity. And I mean, I think that's one of the things I so appreciate about, um, you know, your new book and just, just this move towards what does it mean to be fully human? What does it mean to kind of regain and, and kind of rest in that, you know, we bear God's image, uh, the image of the King. Uh, you know, my wife and I had the privilege, you know, of reading your, you know, your new book, Get Your Life Back, which has led to a lot of great conversations between us. And especially in light of the season of life that we're in with four kids and serving in pastoral ministry. But, you know, when you think about your story and, and just God's faithfulness to you, was just kind of wondering, you know, if you could tell us a little bit about just this new book and maybe some of the reasons why you felt led to write it. Well, I, I think um, I think I could say I had two conversions. And my, <clears throat> my first conversion was to Christ. And then I jumped into church life and, and all the wonderful stuff of that and, you know, Bible studies and short-term missions and all that stuff. And <clears throat> along about my 30s, I really burned out. Mm -hmm. And I, too, was in local church ministry. and I just burned. I fried. And, and I couldn't sustain life. And like you, I mean, it was, you know, young kids and young marriage and all that going on. And, and the second conversion I had was where I, I discovered that the gospel project is not only forgiveness, it's restoration. Mm -hmm. That, you know, Jesus quotes Isaiah 61 when he starts his ministry, and he says, look, I've come to heal your brokenness and free you from darkness. And <clears throat> so the second conversion for me was the gospel project is the healing of our humanity, that God really cares about the whole human person, he cares about your life. He cares about your story. He cares about your past. And uh, I had grown up in an alcoholic home and had not dealt with any of that. Uh, some pretty profound wounding, abandonment. And that eventually led me to get uh, my graduate degree in, in, as a therapist and, and into a counseling practice where I could really see the gospel. The gospel heals human lives. So that was my second conversion. And now jump years ahead, because that was uh, 20 years ago, 25 years ago. Um, in this culture that we're living in now, I, I still see people. I, I don't have a professional practice anymore because my other work is so encompassing. But I still see people on a regular basis. And, and, and they're, what I see is people are really hard pressed. This is a difficult hour to be a human being. Mm -hmm. The pace of life, the freneticness. I mean, when you just, when, Michael, when you said, I, I'm in local church ministry, I'm married and I have four kids. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just thought to myself, you do not have a moment yeah. to, br to breathe. Yeah. And, and I think that's everybody's life in one way or another. There's the pace of life. There's the tsunami of, you know, technology and media that we just partake of and think is normal. And there's very, it's, it's diminishing our humanity. So this book is part of what I think is God's heart right now for people in this hour is the world has gone mad. It's trying to take your soul with it. How can we get our life back? How can we push back when we can't all just go become monks, you know, we, yeah. I have a regular life. I've got bills to pay. I got to walk the dog. I, you know, John, I I've, take I've, the trash out. I've thought about it, John. So it's, you know. don't you? <laughs> yeah. Don't you? And yeah. I think people fantasize a little bit of, well, maybe if I could, you yeah. know, it's that it's my dream home. If I could, you know, yeah. if I could move to, you know, the Pacific, if I could live on an island, if I could, you know, then I'll, then my life would be good. But the rest of us, it's not going to happen. Yeah. And so in our normal lives, what can we do to participate in God's desire to heal our humanity, to heal our souls, to, to have, you know, flourishing lives and not, you know, I would, I would, this all got born out of, I would get home at night and I would just be fried. I, mm -hmm. I'd be cooked. I would be so exhausted, and I had nothing to offer my wife. I had nothing to offer my grandchildren, and and I I saw that, 
and I saw, uh-oh, something's happening to me. I'm a very dry sponge. I, I need water. I need to soak in God. How can I do that in, my, in the reality of, of this busy life we're living? So that's kind of where it came from. And that, that's so helpful, John. I mean, you know, I remember just you share the story in the book of being on a trip with your wife, uh, you know, uh, on an island, just a beautiful setting at a beach and just, you know, someone sitting on a beach chair, just kind of looking at their smartphone at videos and just, you know, it was in one sense kind of reading that and also kind of convicted, you know, I was having a conversation with a, a dear friend, a fellow pastor a while back who was originally uh, from Chile and him commenting on how in so many ways, the pace of pastors and ministry leaders in our current culture can be so dehumanizing. And I've thought about yeah. you know, his comment a lot and he, you know, he said it really out of a heart of compassion. It wasn't, a, you know, a heart of judgment. Um, and that's part of what really kind of struck me is just even his, his compassion at just the pace. And, you know, I was reminded when you wrote that, you know, God never intended our souls to live at the pace we forced them to. So just kind of wondering, how would you describe the Lord's original design for us and say for the pastor, ministry leader, even say the parent, you know, how can we reset to the life God has intended for us? Well, what I want to say right away is let's make it reasonable. Yeah. Because we can't get back to Eden yet. Yep. That's coming. It's coming soon. But in the meantime, let's just take the Jewish, the Hebrew practice. The Hebrew word is uh, of Sabbath is Shabbat. And, and it actually doesn't mean rest or worship. Um, it means stop. The Shabbat means stop. So you, you literally stop, which is why, of course, you know, in in Jewish practice, you know, you don't drive a car and you, you know, you don't go to the grocery store and you don't get on the internet because the idea is your humanity needs to stop on a regular basis. And so where it begins in chapter one in the book is the idea of the one minute pause. Mm -hmm. This, um, what I do now a couple times a day is I just stop for one minute. All we're asking for is 60 seconds. Folks. Yeah. Like this is doable. It's doable. And, and it's a very, very simple practice that has begun to bring a lot of real goodness back into my life. So, you know, I notice I get home at night and I, I've been blasting all day and I pull in the driveway and normally I just jump out of the car, run in the door. But what I do now is I stop 60 seconds, lay my head down at the steering wheel and I just let it all go. I let it all go. Mm -hmm. And learning learning simple practices like that, like a one minute pause, learning to stop during the day. Um, I'll, I'll be going from this interview into a number of meetings today, but I will stop for just a moment between these things. And, and if you create a little bit of breathing room, it's fascinating. Not only is it very healing for the soul, but there's some brain research that says when you do that, it resets your brain. And so you actually come into the next experience much more present. Uh, and I want to be present to the people in my life. I want to be present to my family and present to my friends when they're trying to tell me something important. So that that would be a beginning, just the, the simple stop, the simple pause. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's so helpful. I mean, I, you know, John, after reading your book, just really tried to start implementing that and just kind of the image that came to mind for me just even in, in between meetings, counseling appointments, uh, staff meetings, was almost like this moment of kind of taking a magnet off the bottom of a compass, you know, and just that magnetic field being reoriented as far as, okay, what is true north? And, yeah. and just um, kind of slowing down and, and really remembering, okay, you know, I am made in God's image, but I'm a created being that I'm finite. And, you know, just, you know, reminded me of a conversation that I had over lunch with, you know, several friends in ministry where we were kind of laughing uh, that someone um, should entitle a book, you know, and give the, the title Jesus Napped, you know, 
uh, that we were you know talking about in how in <laughs> vocational ministry that for all of us as followers of Christ, how easy it is to kind of believe, you know, I say this, that, okay, I need to be more Christ-like than Christ, you know, that we need to be everywhere and everything to everyone at all times where, you know, you really unpack this a lot in your book where we see Jesus, you know, constantly removing himself from the crowds and disappointing people. And that's why I really appreciated, you know, you mentioned the, you know, the one minute pause, but just this practice that you describe in the book, uh, benevolent detachment. And was wondering if you yeah. could kind of speak more of what that is and maybe the importance of that for someone who's in leadership. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So um, we are we are very caring people. Most of the people listening to you right now, the people in your world are people that want to care. We mm -hmm. want to love. We want to care about people. Um, but the world right now overloads our compassion. Mm -hmm. it, it overloads our capacity to even to care. And, you know, compassion fatigue is a very real phenomenon in, you know, uh, social work and, you know, counseling and, you know, people involved in trauma, you know, work and first responders, that kind of thing. But but that has actually crept into the entire human race now. Um, the pace of life, the amount of information coming at you, the, the number of heartbreaks, crises, things that you are simply exposed to, it's too much. And the invitation of Scripture is really extraordinary. So you've got Peter uh, in First Peter where he says, cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. It's a, it's an incredible invitation, but I didn't personally know how to practice it. And then you add to that Jesus' teaching about, come to me, you know, you who are weary and heavy laden, take my yoke, and you'll actually learn to live very lightly. My my yoke is easy, my burden is light. And I said, that that's also something that I don't know how to live. So I began to push into this. And the practice that came out of it is something that the Desert Fathers called benevolent detachment. Mm -hmm. Benevolent, because this is not cynicism, it's not anger, it's not resignation, I'm not just ticked and checking out. Benevolent, because it's done in kindness, but detachment, the ability to, to give the world back to God, to let it all go, to literally detach, pull away, get the Velcro off of you. And, for example, as a therapist, if I am coming out of a, a session with someone, you know, we've been listening to the trauma of their childhood, I can't take that home with me. Yeah. And, and, and if, if you don't let that go and, and just turn it over into God's hands, it builds up on you. But then you add to it, you know, it's just listening to the news this morning, the fires in Australia, the yeah. earthquakes in Puerto Rico, that, mm -hmm. you know, that on any caring heart, that's brutal, gang. Yeah. And so benevol benevol the invitation of benevolent detachment is this. And what I love about the one-minute pause is you, you can do this for 60 seconds. You can do it. You pause and you let it all go. And, and what I, what it began, it, it's really a, actually a very funny story. It, it, this began because I would come to Jesus in prayer, and I would be praying about something completely different. I'd be praying about, you know, my taxes or you know, a, a surgery that my mother had or something like that. Mm -hmm. and, but Jesus would respond, give everyone and everything to me. And I'm like, yeah, 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 that's good. That's good, Jesus. That's good. Yes, amen. Now, Lord, what I want to talk to you about is this trip I'm taking. And he would respond, give everyone and everything to me. And, and the reason that he kept re repeating it was because I wasn't doing it. And over the years, this has become, oh, gang, this is a joy. This is a total joy and relief, learning to give it over to God. Mm -hmm. You know, I give my aging mother and her, her care. I, I give my kids who are, you know, in financial need. I give the heartbreak of the latest shooting. I, you know, I just learned about it. I give it, I have to give that to you, God. I, I give everyone, I give my ministry. I give this interview. I give everything and everyone to you, God. And as you do that, even in short moments in your day, just 60 seconds, okay, God, I just whew, give everything to you. He is able to fill you up. Mm -hmm. And, and 
you're able to experience more of the presence of God and more of his sustaining grace, and you feel, well, you know, the invitation of Jesus is freely and lightly. You do feel freer and lighter as you begin to practice that. Yeah, and you mentioned this earlier, John, just even, you know, Christ really intentionally mentioning this, just, you know, where are we yoking our hearts? You know, what are we yoking our hearts to? And and that's why I so appreciate uh, just this, uh, you know, theme of benevolent detachment as far as really turning it over to the Lord, depending on him and yoking our hearts to him. Um, but, you know, it's just that that lie you know, by the great enemy, you know, I would say the first narcissist, you know, Satan, you know, if you want to, you you can be like God, you can take all this on to yourselves and just how suffocating and, and soul crushing that is and how dehumanizing that yeah. is to, to think, okay, I can carry all this uh, on my own shoulders. Um, you know, I, you and I both, you know, have just seen that, you know, in individuals and in marriages where we kind of put the the burden of new heavens and new earth on, you know, human being shoulders to kind of meet all of our needs when we really need to be turning that over to the Lord. Um, and, and so just, you know, made me think you really unpack this. Uh, I want to say it's chapter nine where you talk about um, releasing the, the self life. You know, we've had several people on the pad podcast in the past year talk about just the kind of the growing epidemic of narcissism in our culture as well as in the church. And, you know, we all have those seeds of narcissism in our hearts, but I really appreciated uh, in the chapter where you say this, where you say, you know, if I were writing a book on what has gone wrong in our culture in politics, I would call it the triumph of the offended self. And that's the banner flying over our moment in history. It's the self-life in us that so easily takes offense, enjoys taking offense, for the self was never meant to be master. and we make it so, we fall prey to a thousand heartaches, countless pressures to begin with, because life is now up to us. We are masters of our own destiny, and that's a crushing load. Um, I just wanted to ask, you know, John, in light of all that, you know, could you speak to just the hope and relief that we have in the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we don't, we don't have to carry that weight? Yeah, it was, um, I got to credit Neil Anderson. I was reading one of his books, uh, and he was the one that said the soul was never meant to be master. And when you make the soul master, it, it's actually very crushing. Yeah. And, you know, we, can, we can point to the sinfulness of it. We can point to the self-centeredness of it. But you just point to the fruit of it. Gang, it's brutal. Yeah. It's crushing when, you, uh, when it's all on you and it's all about you. And so learning to surrender the self-life, and th this has been a very, very difficult thing through the history of the church to talk about um, and explain, because we are never told to hate the self. You're supposed to love your neighbor as you love yourself. And so mm -hmm. if you hate yourself, how can you love your neighbor? You know, and, and in fact, by the way, gang, the way you treat your own soul is the way you'll end up treating everyone else's. So if you if you expect this ridiculous pace of your own life, if you have all these expectations on you, if you expect perfection, you will put that on others. Mm -hmm. So you will crush them too. Um, so the surrendering to self-life is not hatred. Again, it's not cynicism. It's not anger. Um, I'm not turning self-hatred against you know me in some sort of Christian way. What I'm saying is, self, you were never meant to be Lord. Mm -hmm. not in my own world and not in the world. And any parent knows this is the basic, you know, this is the toddler. You know, the toddler, the toddler thinks the universe was created for them, for him or her. Yeah. And, you know, learning to teach a child, you are deeply loved. You are so loved. And you're not the center of the universe. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's the basic kind of, you know, step into... Um, what it means to be human and how to love other people and be part of a family and a church and a community, right? So surrendering the self-life is as simple as this. You know, when I get up in the morning and I'm, I'm just starting my day with some prayers, I'd say that. I say, Jesus, I surrender the self-life. And then sometimes that, you know, I surrender my agenda or I surrender right now my frustration with this person or I surrender oh, my desire to buy this thing. Now, they may not be bad things in themselves, 
but all I'm doing is I'm, I'm putting Christ back in the role of leader, shepherd, guide, master. Mm-hmm. And, and by learning to surrender the self-life, and in the passage that you read from the book, it, the offense is a really helpful thing because they, with the culture now is the culture of offense and everybody loves, you know, rating things and I'm only going to give you two stars and da 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 or, you know, social media bombing people and, and that kind of thing. Um, the, if you feel offense, it's probably because your self life was denied something. You know, they did. People didn't ask you how you were doing, or they didn't listen to you when you were trying to tell them. You know, if you and offense is just a good warning light to go. Uh oh, the self life is operating here. I surrender that. I don't hate it. I don't kill it. I just simply give it to you, God, so that I might be filled with the life of Christ. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just think it's just such a, a sweet reminder of just you know. Um, that it's okay to be human, you know? Um, and I think there's just so many things that just invite us to this pace and, you know, that our default, our sinful default is, Hey, I can be God. I can control this. I can manage this. Um, but just Christ, you know, gently, tenderly inviting us to rest in him and just the gift of what it means to be human, the gift of yeah. what it means to be able to, to rest. And like you said, just with Sabbath, just to, to stop, um, you know, even in the midst of our day to stop and be reminded of, you know, OK, it's OK if this person is disappointed with me um, that, you know, Jesus, you know, the people that you, you know, you mentioned Isaiah 61, you know, just the people you know, that Jesus grew up with and I always thought, you know, that he probably built tables for that, you know, this is the cliff that they tried to push him off of that. He probably climbed as a small boy, right. you know, that, um, he was constantly disappointing people. And just for us to be able to, to rest in that, that that's, that's okay to, to sleep, to eat, you know, to, yeah. to, to stop. Um, you know, just yeah. in line with that, John, just, you know, before we started recording the podcast, we talked a little bit, you know, about just that documentary, you know, Why Beauty Matters, um, just uh, BBC documentary uh, by Roger Scruton, where even as an unbeliever, he just really, you know, stresses the importance of beauty. And that's something that you, throughout your ministry, what I've really appreciated over the years, John, just you've really emphasized that in your writings and in your talks and your podcast. Um, you mentioned it in the book, just that importance of beauty, just as far as the resetting of our souls. And so just kind of wondering what role would you say beauty plays in that healing of our souls? And, and where are the places we can find that kind of beauty to, to really move towards a fuller humanity? Yeah, yeah, right. So the conversation is the gospel project is the restoration of your life, the restoration of your soul your heart, the restoration of your personality. <clears throat> he really does want, he, he wants wholeheartedness for us. How do we get that in a busy life? Well, Shabbat is one, just pause, just stop, learning to stop, learning to let it go. Benevolent detachment is another. Um, but beauty is a surprising gift that most people don't take advantage of, although it's all around us. Um, and you don't have to, you know, go to the Alps or, you know, to Tahiti. Our world is absolutely saturated with beauty. And the reason God did that is because beauty heals the soul. Beauty heals trauma and, and it heals traumatized souls. And it, again, it was a young therapist, as a young therapist, that I began to discover this. I was trying to help people through some really, really traumatic memories and that sort of thing. And nothing helped but their experiences of beauty. So it would be music, or it would be nature, or it would be the fact that someone brought them flowers. And, and the power of beauty, beauty reassures us. It's very, very reassuring. Beauty reassures us that goodness wins. Mm-hmm. Beauty reassures us that there is still goodness in the world. Um, beauty is very calming. It's very assuaging. It washes over us. You know, it's why people, when you go on vacation, people don't typically go to the mall. You know, they go to the beach. They go to the mountains. 
Yeah. They, you know, they, they go to a cabin. They pick some place pretty. And the reason is when they're trying to, you know, recharge their batteries and get their life back in that, you know, one week window, they have a year or whatever. Um, we go, we look to beauty without even knowing it. And what I'm suggesting is you can do this every day. Beauty is all around you. Um, in, in Shabbat, that just a simple stop to recognize it and receive it for the gift it is. Cause I see, I see it every day. Beauty is all around me. The water drops on my windshield. You know, the way the sunlight was coming through the kitchen window this morning, the sound of songbirds. But if I am blasting already through my day, I don't receive the grace. Mm -hmm. It's like God is holding out this cup of water to me, and I just just ignore it. So what I'm suggesting is the practice of let beauty back into your life. Those things that you enjoy, the things that bring you beauty, your garden or your neighbor's garden or just a simple walk in the neighborhood, getting to the park, putting beautiful music on in the house. Oh, this Christmas, this last Christmas, for me, it was Handel's Messiah. And I I didn't grow up with choral music and I didn't grow up with classical music, but the beauty of certain sections of Handel's Messiah is so healing. And I would just, I just play it in the house and just let it minister to my soul. So this is another grace that I describe in the book is, is just letting beauty back into your life. Let it minister to you, even in very small, simple ways during the day, just stop and receive it. John, you know, I just uh, really appreciate our conversation today. So we're going to wrap up now and just so thankful uh, for your time today and how the Lord is using you and how he's used you over the years. Um, and just so John was just wondering if you could, you know, close our time today in prayer. Yes, I'd love to. Thank you, Michael. Um, Jesus, our prayer is really very simple. Psalm 23, he restores my soul. Jesus, restore our souls. Restore my soul. Show me how to begin to cooperate with you in the things you are already doing or inviting me to or offering to restore my soul. I return my soul to you as my God. Come and fill my soul. Come and saturate me with your love. Restore my soul. In your name, we all pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, John. Yeah, you're so welcome, Michael. Thanks for a great conversation. Thanks for listening to today's episode. If you've been enjoying the podcast, I'd really appreciate it if you would leave a review on iTunes or Facebook. If you know someone who might enjoy or be encouraged by the show, feel free to share the podcast with them. Your willingness to share the show is one of the best ways to help it grow. As always, thanks for listening. Until next time. Mm-hmm.